if there's a good deal to be had for Canada, which I think there is, then, then we, will, uh, we will look to sign it. They are in a position that's not a good position for Canada. Canada needs to really step up here this week. We're going to fight right down to the end. I chose my words carefully. Uh, today, we discussed some tough issues. Time is quickly running out. Canadian officials were back at the NAFTA negotiating table in Washington this week. Talks, though, have been described now as tense and slow. And some Americans, as you heard, there are expressing frustration with Canada. At issue is here to try and make sense of it all. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight. And Eric Grenier is uh, nearby here in Ottawa. Good to see everybody. So let's start sort of there on that uh, Christia Freeland clip, which was from today. Chantal, I'll start with you. It did seem uh, that she was a little more restrained in, in her tone today, and there was no indication of when anybody is getting back to the table. How are you reading things from here? Well, I'm glad you're telling us that the clip is from today, because it could have been <laughs> from at some point last week or three weeks ago. Um, I was watching the reading the body language thing uh, on Chrystia Freeland, and I was reminded that when I was covering the constitutional negotiations, there would be weeks when everything was working towards a, a denouement and weeks where it was an impasse. And in both cases, there was nothing very different happening. It was just a, 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 a to and fro. It's normal in a negotiation. I don't read very much from the pressure coming from the U.S. in the sense that the yeah. pressure uh, for a deadline there is uh, the midterm elections. There, that's not a Canadian deadline. If the hopes was to put pressure on Canada or to find people to put pressure on, on Trudeau and his team to arrive at a quick deal, I'm not sure that's going to work. Yeah, I mean, I wondered, Andrew, whether though those people speaking out this week had not been mandated to do so by the, the head negotiator for the United States, which might be very skeptical of me or, or very true. I don't know how much that would be happening. Uh, skepticism is very much in order. Uh, I would only add two things. One is uh, it is significant that these were coming from within the Congress for a reason I'll yes. come back to in a second. And secondly, it wasn't just coming from the U.S. side of the border. You heard some noises this week from Canadian business. Uh, expressing some concern that maybe when the Prime Minister says uh, no deal is better than a bad deal, that he might actually mean it. Mm. Uh, and that they might mm. be prepared to let the deal, uh, uh, to let the talks fail, either just out of a, a hardline bargaining position or for the political benefits that might be gleaned from standing up to Donald Trump, et cetera. Now, yeah. there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, depending on the reasons why you let the talks fail. If you let the talks fail because in, in a to, to prevent the U.S. from eliminating the dis dispute resolution mechanism, for example, then that's well and good. If it's to just to save supply management, some of us would have a large, a large problem with that. <laughs> so it will depend on, on what the issues are that they're taking yeah. a, a hard line on. Yeah. But I think what's worrying the Canadian business is that we are placing our bets on the idea that the Congress, uh, when push comes to shove, will not ratify Trump's uh, attempt to go to a, a bilateral Canada, you know, U.S.-Mexico deal yeah. and won't get rid of NAFTA when, if he asks them to do, do that. And that may or may not be a good bet, and that's what the significance of those noises coming from U.S. Congress. Well, and uh, go ahead, Chantal, jump in, yeah. No, two things, though. Uh, if, if Canada w was about to sacrifice uh, a good deal, for instance, for the auto industry to salvage supply management, uh, I suspect that uh, the union people who are around the table and who are still standing shoulder to shoulder with, with the Canadian government would say something about that. Uh, one of Mr. Trudeau's biggest critic in this country, the Premier of Ontario, went to see for himself and seemed to be satisfied that uh, no one was playing games mm. that he couldn't live with. So uh, until I see some evidence that the Canadian negotiating team and the wide sense of the word is starting to shoot at each other. I'm mm -hmm. not going to see that as anything other than pressure tactics. Plus, the calendar, uh, whatever people may say about Congress, that is totally true, except if you're going to give the notice that you want to pull out of NAFTA and you're Donald Trump, you're not going to have a Congress around to do anything about it pretty much until next year at this point. Okay, Eric, you weigh in there in terms of how you see maybe the, the, the deadline approaching rapidly without, I mean, we don't really know, but it doesn't seem as though we're closer to, to a deal at this, at this stage anyway. 
Well, in terms of the political fallout of it, we know that uh, Canadians don't like Donald Trump. There was a poll out just today from Abacus Data. 80% of Canadians have a negative opinion of him, just 9% a positive one. So if they don't get a deal out of this, I think that a lot of Canadians are likely to put the blame on Donald Trump rather than uh, Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland, at least yeah. in the short term. Uh, of course, in the longer term, if the deadline for the federal Liberals is really the next election in terms of uh, what the impact of this will be, if the economy is hurting from whatever comes out of these negotiations, uh, even if uh, now how people might blame Donald Trump rather than Justin Trudeau. If the economy is hurting, the government is likely to wear that uh, next October. So what if um, what if the, we don't make the deadline here? Uh, play the what, what if game with me. If you, <laughs> well, what, it's what, a, is, what is the deadline? Well, who, the, the, who says there's a firm deadline? The deadline that they are working with is the end of the month, all right? So let's yes, take them but, at their word. But does if we <laughs> miss that deadline, though, all right, and they say they're going to go ahead with Mexico, does it then uh, become more difficult for us to get back in? That's that's what I want to know. It's Sontel. very difficult for them to go ahead. I, I'm not going to become a, an expert at this, but I do understand that it's very difficult logistically for them to go ahead with Mexico within a short time frame. Yeah. And, and as I say, they would have to get the Congress to sign off on it, and it's an open question, to say the least, whether the Congress would. Uh, I do agree with Chantel that uh, you know deadlines here are basically made to be broken. Uh, there's sure. no particular uh, drop-dead date, really, for any of this. Uh, and there's some, uh, a strong case, I think, for the, from the Canadian perspective, to stall, to, to run out the clock, and to wait until after the midterms. Uh, the, the, the biggest single factor here is Trump and the degree to which Trump can kind of have his way here. And he grows weaker by the day uh, as all these different forces close in on the United States, including the Mueller inquiry. And if, in fact, you get a Democratic Congress out of that that controls the committees and can call, call witnesses and really hold them to account, then that's, I think, worth waiting, even if you get a more, slightly more protectionist but, Congress. But, you're not, of, but you're, not su you're not suggesting that that's the strategy. I, I don't know whether it is right. or not. I think, it's a, I think it's a strategy worth pursuing, and it may be the strategy we're pursuing. I don't know. Okay, I want to shift gears to this week because everybody came back uh, here to the to their office jobs, not their writing jobs. And uh, with it came a bit of a surprise. Take a listen to this. I announced today that I am withdrawing from the government benches to take my seat among my Conservative colleagues. She is ready to work hard as a member of a strong and united Conservative team. So I don't want to overblow this because I'm not sure that that story lasted more than a day and a half. But Eric, <laughs> give us a sense of how that kind of thing can impact momentum, story, what we might see in the, in the coming weeks. Well, in, in terms of Monday when that happened, I think it, it may, made sure that we were talking about a gain for the Conservative Party and not the fact that they had just lost Maxim Bernier, who had launched the People's Party uh, the preceding Friday. So no one was talking about Maxim Bernier anymore. And Andrew Scheer was able to make the case that, look at him, he is uniting Conservatives uh, from across the spectrum, uh, r rather than having to answer questions about why uh, a new party is splintering off uh, from the Conservatives. But, you know, he did win that day. And as you said, uh, we stopped talking about it really uh, very quickly afterwards. So it's about whether he can continue to keep winning days up until next year. Andrew. Uh, I think this will be ne not necessarily remembered too much in the, into the future. Uh, just to pick up a point that Eric was making, uh, we're going to get into issues, I think, where, uh, and the Liberals may, may play this to their advantage, where they bring forward questions that uh, the traditional Conservative Party will have a hard time opposing and where Maxime Bernier will be only too delighted to oppose them. Mm. And so there can be some fissures and some, some uh, tensions that can be opened up there. But certainly on the day and in the week, uh, it did uh, hurt any chance of the Liberals trying to claim momentum. It get, did get people talking. I think the most damaging thing is the degree to which this might crystallize for center-right Liberals, for so-called blue Liberals, the degree to which this government has really left them behind. This is not a government in which there's really a lot of place for uh, the, the so-called blue Liberals. And uh, in this case, the MP in question, I think, fit that description. Chantal, uh, and I, yeah, go ahead. No, but maybe she did fit that description. But the, uh, it was a, a damaging, a lasting damage to a governing party from losing someone is usually over an issue that people can identify. Yes. And the fact that she couldn't come up with one uh, means that, yes, you win a day, but where do you win it? On Parliament Hill or, or in the larger country? If, if Justin Trudeau had lost an MP from BC over his decision to buy a pipeline, yes. or one from Alberta over what's happened in court over the Trans Mountain pipeline, 
that would have had more legs than an MP who lives in an area where the Conservatives have done well in the past in elections, uh, deciding a month after having said nice things about the Prime Minister uh, that she can't bear it anymore. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. If you're going to quit a party, there better be something very specific to complain about, which I think she she was lacking. And when we did those sort of histories of floor crossers, I had actually forgot all about Eve, Eve Adams crossing the floor. So I mean, that goes to show you how quickly those stories last. They don't actually last that long. Eric, you've been looking at some of the latest poll numbers for for the parties, as you do. Um, are we seeing any shifts in these early days? Uh, well, we have seen some shifts over the last few months, and I think we can look at the numbers with that. We've seen that things are more or less returning to where they were in 2015, uh, yeah. because if we go back about six months ago, we had the Conservatives and the Liberals more or less in a tie, uh, but since then, the Liberals have pulled back to about 39 percent, the Conservatives somewhere around 33. A uh, problem for the Conservatives it might also be that the New Democrats are down to 16 percent. Uh, Jagmeet Singh has not been able to break through very well, so the Liberals are more or less starting where they, t where they began the uh, their mandate, uh, which is not a bad position for the Conservatives, that they're still within striking distance, they're still raising a lot of money. Uh, if these are still the numbers going into next summer, I don't think the Conservatives would be particularly upset because they could work with those numbers. Andrew? Uh, the Liberals have got a, a hard year ahead of them in terms of they've got the pipeline, they've got the carbon pricing, they've got NAFTA, all these issues that are going to be very difficult for them. So on that side, you say they're, they're in, a, in a tough spot. But a weak NDP and conservatives yeah. fighting amongst yeah. themselves more than compensates for that at this point. Chantal, last word to you. Uh, uh, and also uh, difficult relations with a polarizing conservative Ontario premier uh, should actually work to uh, Justin Trudeau's advantage, especially if you combine it with uh, the weakness of the NDP. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to see uh, how they pull themselves out of, of the rut that they are in at this point. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Eric, good of you to join us this week. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to our At Issue podcast edition. You'll get some extra content this week. We're talking about the upcoming provincial elections in New Brunswick and Quebec. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.